All right, you guys can hear me okay? Testing, testing. Hey, Craig, Jim, Joe, Robert, Richard, John, Harold, Bob, Rob, Jorge, Raymond, Sergi, Constantine, Mark, Michael, Raymond, Rob, <laughs> Matt. How you guys doing, George? Yeah, I bet it is. Where are you at, Sergi? Hey, Jordy. Boston. Yeah, it's already dark there. That's crazy. Hey, Mr. Deck. How are you, sir? All right. Hey, Charles, Wayne, Miss Ava. Well, it is one of those webinars. Yeah, not really a webinar per se. I'm going to show you what I've been working night and day on for quite literally months now. And we've only finally gotten it done. It is, it's been just amazing what, uh, what we've had to go through, but you know, it's not simple stuff we're doing. It's, definitely cutting edge there's there's nothing like it available or even thought of anywhere else that i know of so before i get into it and to be quite honest with you i don't have a very structured presentation today uh i've been working night and day trying to get all this stuff done for you guys i've been you know saying tomorrow, next week, tomorrow, next week. And every time I do that, literally within an hour or two, we end up finding, you know, other problems. We fix one problem and that creates a problem somewhere else that I don't even see until, um, you know, moments later, or days later. But yeah, it is, it is worth the wait. It's, um, it's pretty cool stuff. So let me, uh, Rurt is asking, is there audio? Yes, there is, but he can't hear me, obviously. Sound is good though, huh? Okay. Hey, Patrick. Darcy. Okay. So before we get into it, obviously, I'm sure most of you guys know, but if there's, if there are anyone new uh, in here now, trading is incredibly difficult and not something to take lightly. And despite what many people would have you believe, you're not going to buy some holy grail that's going to make you, you know, five grand a week for the rest of your life just by following a red light, green light system. It doesn't quite work like that. Uh, obviously, there are some people that have that sort of thing, but yeah, I don't know them. And I don't know anybody that's selling anything like that. It's incredibly difficult but obviously very rewarding once you get the hang of it, but it does take time. Like anything else, it's a very difficult, difficult and time consuming endeavor to master. And the potential losses are enormous, especially if you, uh, you know, don't, don't have full control over your, I wouldn't say necessarily full control over your emotions, but control over how you react to those emotions. Uh, you can go into a downward spiral pretty quickly and blow your whole entire account 
in no time. So don't trade with your lunch money. Don't trade with your rent money. If you're not trading with money that you can afford to lose, then you shouldn't be trading. And essentially what I tell people when they ask me, you know, how long is it going to take for me to learn all this and actually become profitable? What's the time span look like? I can't say with any degree of certainty whether or not anyone is going to get the hang of it. But from the people that I've spoken with, the guys that have been with us for three, four years, pretty much everybody says uh, at least a full year to learn everything and then another year to begin to implement it properly and sort of give it your own uh, you know, little nuance and, and style, essentially adopting what we're doing and teaching and then uh, fitting it to your own style. Most, most people that I know that are really doing well are swing trading. Uh, some people that's, you know, not enough action, so they want to day trade. So just depending upon how you want to apply it, it applies to anything from swing trading all the way down to, you know, short, very fast time frames, uh, what I would call scalping. And, um, for, you know, for any market, stocks, Forex, futures. But I say about two years until you get the hang of it and you can begin to see some consistency. So it's like anything else in life. You want to learn how to be a doctor or a lawyer. You know, you can't buy some course from somebody and go out and start practicing law next year. It takes a lot of time and there's a lot of uh, potential harm that you can do to yourself and your account. This is the agenda that I would love to do today. It's very nice, isn't it? I'd love to cover all that today. But what I'll do instead is go directly into some charts. We're going to work through what's going on in the ES. I think that would probably be good for a lot of you guys anyhow. What's happening? What we're likely to expect at this point and uh, go through some of the recent setups and show how the stuff that I've been building is working, give you guys a little bit of an update uh, as to where we're at in development, what we've completed, what our projected timeline is, our uh, you know, working, working timeline, and what we're about to be launching here in January. So I'll, um, I don't think I need to go through too much about myself here. This is where I end up spending a lot of time, too much time. Let me see. This thing is, mm -hmm. one second here. Well, just as well. I had a couple of slides in here, but <laughs> evidently they have, well, they're there. They just won't show for some reason. They did it a minute ago. They did a minute ago. Uh, I was just going to give a little bit of a background about myself, but I don't really think that's necessary. I know you guys know who I am, but just very, very quickly here, I started in 2007 working at a, at a fund in Ecuador for um, a friend of mine. His uh, grandfather was the president of Ecuador uh, during Reagan's term, and they're a, a pretty, pretty big family, well-to-do family there in Ecuador, and I was working for him and his family. They had a fund, kind of a private fund, and he offered me a job out of college. We went to college together in uh, American University of Paris and I graduated magna cum laude and was really good friends with he and his fiance at the time. And um, he wanted to do real estate development and, you know, all this stuff that I thought sounded pretty cool. And he offered me a job. So I took it in Ecuador. And when I got there, 
<clears throat> next thing I know, I'm going to be working with uh, these guys that are managing money and I need to learn how to trade and I need to learn how to make automated systems and pretty overwhelming stuff. So he ended up spending at least 150 grand just on courses and software and the guys were already doing pretty well and um, using market geometry, which I'll get into in a minute, trend channels and median lines and Wyckoff analysis, which is a kind of combination of patterns in price action and volume. And they were doing it all on weekly, daily, and like a 240 minute chart. And that was it. So they were doing pretty well, but my friend thought that, you know, Mr. Wise Guy over here would be able to figure out how to do better and make more money faster and learn how to do automation and, and all that stuff. So that's what I spent a lot of my time on studying and learning uh, as much about system development and, and stuff like that as I could. Long story short, that was 2007. The market obviously tanked and I ended up going home um, by mid to the end of 2009 and um, just kept going, kept going on it and developing, you know, my own stuff and working night and day on this. I've been working night and day on this stuff for, I don't know. It's been what, I guess that's 11 years now. Found Bloodhound, which was really game changing for me. It enabled me to do all the testing that I couldn't quite do without a developer to program everything. So it allowed me to program out and do proper back testing and, and get into all of that and figure out pretty quickly that most of what people teach and sell and use and you know, all these books on technical analysis and all this stuff, just like 90 over 90% of people lose money less than, I think they say less than four and a half percent or sorry, less than three and a half percent actually make money. And I think it's about two and a half percent make enough that you could say is an actual living from trading. And I think that's partly because 95% of what's being taught out there is quite useless. I don't want to say it's disinformation that people do it on purpose. I think, you know, people read stuff, they read the books, just like you can get a cruddy education at college and go and promulgate all that nonsense. The same thing happens in this industry. And uh, I think people realize that those that are looking into this and wanting to do it for themselves probably have some money. So you get the old shyster and uh, used car salesman from time to time, more often than not, actually. So at any rate, uh, with the stuff that I've put together, it was a result of uh, basically testing all these different systems, making all these different systems for all these people. I think I had well over, I tried to figure it out the other day. It was, it was over 250 people that I had worked with, several vendors and whatnot automating their systems in Bloodhound so they could test and uh, try to automate. And pretty much none of it worked. So I took the things that I knew did work, namely market geometry, which is real support and resistance, and volume and momentum analysis, and doing that across multiple time frames because it's necessary to use multiple time frames. And I think you'll see that here directly and then um, finished putting all that together, ran it in SIM for about a year and a half and um, ended up doing exceptionally well. I'm not gonna go through all this. This is, we don't, you guys know that I'm not about a bunch of, you know, renaming oscillators and calling it my secret awesome oscillator and all that. What we're doing is trying to make the analysis that we're doing as effective, well, as efficient as possible to do it as quickly as possible so that we can monitor more markets and be able to watch more, do the analysis faster so that we can take better setups and wait for only those uh, 
you know, pristine setups. And that's what I'm going to kind of get into now. So, uh, this, this is the chart that I'm using for combining all of the different rules for confirmation. But before I get into that, I want to talk about, uh, trend and reversal patterns and how we find those reversal patterns and the very likely most probable area where the market will reverse from next. So just give me one second. I'm going to run this little executable here and I'll read some of your questions real quick, answer a couple of those, and then we'll get into it. Before I get too far into it, I want to show you uh, kind of where we're at in Ninja Trader 8. And then we'll, we'll come back to that after I get through some of this um, pattern and market geometry stuff. So give me one second. Okay, good. Now you guys should see a one 20 minute chart. All you want for Christmas is your two front indicators. <laughs> You got them. I, I uploaded all of the software. So we had an, another major malfunction last night at uh, guess what time? 3 a.m., 3.30 a.m. And it took us until 4.15. So I've literally slept between two and a half and four and a half hours a night for six weeks. I, I, if, if you could die from it, I'd be dead. Sometimes I think you can because I feel like it. Merry Christmas, Pep. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'll go through that, Joe. There at the end. Well, since you asked right now, let me just do that real fast. Before I forget, so right now, the plan that we're, the plan that we're working now, uh, and obviously I'm bouncing around and it's probably going to be like that most of this presentation, but the way that we're doing it, moving to Ninja Trader 8 has been pretty rough. And I think most people would say that, uh, just so happens that we don't have access to some of the different libraries where you know, like with .NET, you have all these different libraries that you can use for WPF, for making the forms, for stuff like um, these property grids and, uh, you know, like this for our import manager for the analysis live, which I'll get into in a little bit. So we literally have to program a lot of this stuff from scratch. And um, it's been quite, quite the ordeal way more than I expected it would be. And it's evidently cost a lot of people uh, their businesses from what I understand. So we're not in that realm. We're not in that group. But the fact of the matter is with two full-time developers, I mean, we have a staff of what, six, six people now, four full-time, not including myself. And then, um, all these updates, all of the massive improvements that we've made, which have been free updates since day one. So, well, long story short, here, here's the skinny of it. We're going to re, redo the way that we're kind of reorganize the business model, the sales model for how we're marketing this stuff and this by the end of the year, this is going to be the last time that we'll, that will allow full membership for life with free updates for life, which I've got quite literally another two years of stuff written out for us to uh, add and improve with the volume analyst in the, in the toolbar and the automation and all of the trade management stuff that I'm putting together now. So it's going to get better and better and better. And it's already pretty exceptional as of right now. 
So this is going to be the last time that we're going to have a discount for lifetime membership. And starting next year, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do it. If it's going to be like Bloodhound and for Blackbird, like Shark Indicators does with a, a yearly maintenance fee or, you know, free updates for say 4.1 to 4.2 to 4.3. But when we go from a version from four to five, which will include, you know, major new features and improvements and um, essentially like a, a brand new version with lots of extra features, uh, there'll, there'll be a fee associated with that because the amount of time and money and work that's involved in every single one of these improvements and new versions has been just incredible. So I'm not making money. I'm making enough money to keep development going. All of this is, well, let me kind of put it to, to you like this. I don't want to sound selfish or, or whatever, but everything that I've done, all of this stuff that I've developed has been for my own trading because I, I want to basically, like most of you do, I want to automate as much as possible. I want to take as much human decision or indecision or, you know, whatever you want to call it. I want to take as much human intervention away from it as possible. I don't think I'll, you know, ever get to the point to where it's going to be completely 100% automated, possibly. Once I automate the market geometry and that's coming into 2019, but um, always retaining some level of discretion, especially uh, when it comes to the actual initiation of the trade. But once the trade has been initiated, I want to be hands off because that's where I self-sabotage is, you know, I, I get into these great trades and Sometimes out of nowhere, I'll just close it because I have a feeling, you know, and uh, then it runs seven, 800, 800 ticks for the next day and a half in my, what would have been in, in my favor. So all of this has been to get to the point where I can automate as much as possible and perform the most exceptional analysis as, uh, as possible. And that involves really, really advanced volume analysis and momentum analysis and pattern recognition. I'm happy to say that I have some pattern recognition already done as of uh, now that's just been uploaded to the site actually. And I'll get into that here in a minute. But what we're doing now with all of this is pretty incredible. Let me just run through this briefly. So I can get this out of the way. I really hate going over this stuff, but it's necessary to keep us alive and keep all of my guys and their families fed. So give me, give me one second and then I'll just run down this real quick. And this has not been updated. I mean, some of this stuff is just ridiculous. This, this doesn't even describe the half of it. What I wanted to be able to do was to be able to access these areas from the market geometry from all these different time frames. All of our con uh, confirmation signals from the divergence, from the, the volume, onto a, a single chart so that I could access the, the data from all these other charts without completely crashing the platform. And um, it has taken about three years to get it to where it's finally flawless and does exactly what I want it to do. We had a version of uh, these readers, what I'm calling the indicator. This is the, used to be the indicator reader. It's now the replicator because it does more than just read the other charts and the signals from the other charts. It actually can build whatever indicator it's attached to. So if I'm, you know, on a five minute chart and I want to go and grab the uh, momentum or really any indicator from another chart, say a, a daily chart or an hourly chart, and have it give the exact values from that larger chart on the five minute. I can do that with this indicator, and I can also bring it into our automated systems 
and um, it doesn't cost any CPU. I don't have to build another chart virtually inside of that base chart. Uh, it just makes everything so much more efficient. And from this system came the market geometry readers, the volume analyst reader, which reads all the volume signals from the other charts, the divergence, uh, what is now the divergence analyst reader, so that we can read all of the data that we need from all these different charts onto a single chart without bogging down the computer. And that's on Indutrader 7. So imagine all of this working, what I'm about to show you, with seven workspaces with 11 charts each without crashing NinjaTrader 7. Imagine how efficient that, that is in NinjaTrader 8. So we're, we're well on our way to um, getting all this stuff into NinjaTrader 8. We've made some massive, massive, we've overcome some massive, massive hurdles and obstacles with the toolbar. Uh, but for those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about right now, I'll get into that here in a moment. So we start off with trying to find the context for the trade. And that is, which is why we have all these different charts. I know this may seem overwhelming, but the way I've, I've put it together now with uh, the automation aspect of this makes it much, much easier to manage. And the fact that what we're doing now with this analysis live service, which I've been saying, we're going to launch, we're going to launch, we're, we're going to launch. I haven't launched it yet because I wanted everything completely perfect so that when we finally launched it, we would be able to de dedicate, you know, half of the day to just that and not have to worry about all this development stuff and, you know, do, do stuff kind of half, uh, not as well as we could have or should. And I don't know what it is. For some reason, I have to have everything just so. And if I find something that's not right, I cannot do anything else until I fix it. And it's, it's incredibly debilitating, but um, I guess it makes for a final product that is exceptional, but it, it, it does slow me down for sure. So that's why it's taken so long. This is the piece of the puzzle that facilitates that whole thing where I'm literally drawing on the chart and all of the analysis that I perform and that Josh performs, we have three analysts, myself included. Everything that I will mark up on the chart for instance, just say this trend channel. And oh, what do you know? Look at where the high look at where the high was. Perfectly right there. This is supply and demand as it is, not as people say it is. So everything that I mark up and, for instance, highlight, hit a hotkey and export, that immediately gets sent to a server. 15 seconds later, upload successful. Right now it's uh, popping up on everybody's charts, on their actual charts. And then... This stuff is so incredible. And then if we have two or more groups of charts where a bar is coming together with uh, areas defined on those charts, and I can even access this little rectangle here, then we'll get the signal on this chart. So everyone that's getting this analysis live service where we're exporting all this stuff, marking up everything, and I'll run through uh, some examples from this past week in the ES so you can see some of the massive shorts we've had. Uh, all of that will be clearly defined 
on your charts. You can literally grab this stuff and then move it around after the fact, after it pops up, you know, uh, totally magically on your charts. And then through the use of our reader system, which I was describing a moment ago, if we have a bar coming together with multiple areas from at least two groups of charts, you'll get the signal from Bloodhound uh, signaling that yes, you have enough coming together for a potential trade. And then I have another template with the confirmation. So in Blackbird, which is the strategy component of this, I have the replicator indicator accessing these two charts, bloodhound signals, and it can then initiate the trade. So I'm not gonna have time to get into showing Blackbird in, in full effect here, but I'll have all of this stuff. I thought I'd have it all completely done last night, but I um I I had to tweak it and make it perfect, but it's pretty exceptional now. So I'll have it up on the site by the end of the afternoon. We'll try to get done within the next hour here so that I can complete that. So this Bloodhound template, each one of these, so for instance, what is that? The five minute chart? That would be, see I have them, I have them laid out in groups. Men two, tick two. That's one group, that's group two. That's part of group two here. Okay, this is the market geometry from men five. So I'll connect that here. And now historically, you won't see the signals because if we updated every single time something changed historically, it would bog Ninja 7 down and it, would, it wouldn't work, it would crash. So in real time, you don't have to do anything. It's just automatic and you'll get the signals in real time. But historically, if you want to go back and kind of back test and see how the day was and, you know, run through these exports and import them one at a time per when they were exported and kind of scroll through bar by bar with our little chart sync tool here, which allows you to go bar by bar the way it should be done, connecting all these charts together then you can click this little notify button here and it will give you the signal from that area on this chart. And what time is that? That is 12, 12 at 12, 15. at 12, 15. I'm going the wrong way. Well, I guess that is 12, 12 at 12, 15, isn't it? Yeah, right there. So here it was just barely close enough to get the signal. But when it's all combined, you wouldn't get the signal unless it's coming together perfectly with another group of areas, which every major turning point, just about every major turning point occurs just like that, which is exactly why I built it the way that I have like this. Uh, John is asking, is there a 15 second delay? No. Um, from the minute I export, let's see, 15 seconds. Yeah, I think it's uh, every 10 seconds it updates. Every 10 seconds it, it sends. Uh, yeah, if you're trading based on a 15 second time frame, then this is probably not for you anyway, John. Um, market, market geometry in general, I don't think is really geared towards super, super fast charts, but all these areas are on the chart. It's not like I'm exporting it right as it's coming up to it. This one would have been exported, you know, three, four or five hours before we hit this area. So everything is before a setup happens everything is already lined up and sitting there waiting. It's not like we have to export seconds before the trade occurs. You know, you understand what I'm saying? So 
what we're doing with all this is defining all of the areas that are lining up for the next major reversal. And then when the market gets there, right when it gets there, uh, the signal occurs. So there, there is no waiting for the signal. It's instantaneous. It's everything is real time that we're doing. The only thing that has a 10 second delay is from the moment I click the chart, hit my hotkey right there. It, it fires every 10 seconds. So if I clicked it at nine and a half seconds, it'll show up on your chart that next half second, you see. But within 10 seconds after I export, it'll show up on your charts. Pretty cool stuff, pretty elaborate system. So let's do this. Let me go into some of the basics here real quick. And then we'll go through some of these uh, improvements that I've put together. So first of all, what we're doing is identifying, see this is a, a one 20 minute chart. Now I have up to a 240 minute. And uh, just to show you the area that we're at right now, if we break through this area Monday and Tuesday, then we're going much, much, much further down. But I, I'd be very surprised if we didn't turn up from here, at least temporarily. This is a pretty awesome, uh, beautiful area of, of support. All of these areas, all of the major swings that these areas produce are what gave us the major turning points throughout back here. So we have quite a lot coming together at this low. And I'll show you some more on the logarithmic charts on the weekly, uh, for instance, in the NASDAQ and the Dow later. So just a little heads up there. This is a, a pretty important spot that if we break doom and gloom, I was hoping that we would stop here and it wouldn't look quite so bad and we'd actually turn up one more time, but it just keeps getting worse and worse. So not looking, not looking too good, but let's do this. So the main way that most people that I know and uh, have worked with the way that they consistently make money is by identifying corrections or retracements within a trend, not bottom picking, not top picking, but everything that I'm describing, everything that I'm telling you right now is a function of the time frame that you're looking at. So if I'm saying that we're in a downtrend, well, we're in a downtrend on every single time frame that there is, but at this swing high right here, this is a two hour chart. We're in a downtrend. We've taken out a recent major swing high or intermediate, intermediate swing high, if you want to call it that, on this chart. But then on, say, the five minute chart, it looks pretty well like we've uh, turned back up into an uptrend. Okay, so trend is always a function of the time frame that you're looking at. And that's another reason why we use so many time frames. So the way that we do this, we're identifying the pullbacks within a trend, and those pullbacks have very particular uh, characteristics. Typically a trending move, the stronger it is, the more space between the uh, corrections and the less the overlap between the waves, like in this really strong push up. See, there wasn't a lot of overlap in here, right? So that was a, a pretty solid little, little run up there. And then after we see something like this, well, on that little pullback, we're expecting another move up, right? So we're looking for these little 
retracements within these uh, major major trends and once we turn down like that with incredibly fast momentum then we're looking for retracements back up and these little re retracements have like I said very particular characteristics and we do use Elliott wave to some extent the majority of the extent uh, pertains to identifying the corrective patterns typical ABC type uh, patterns zigzags flats and uh, the typical relationships between those waves within the correction now I know I'm, I'm gonna get over some of your your heads right now this is I was gonna say intermediate stuff but I guess it, it's more advanced type stuff so if you have no idea what I'm talking about uh, I'll try to explain it a little bit but for instance from here down well for one thing after a big move down like this we're expecting another move down similar in size and slope to the preceding move and you can you know relatively I was gonna say probabilistically but um, you can with some certainty with some degree of probability greater than 0.5 expect uh, a third wave so essentially what I'm what I'm trying to say is if we've got a massive move like this and we're looking for that corrective wave back up we can relatively safely expect that there will be at least one more wave of similar size and slope to the preceding wave that came into the correction so we want to find the end of uh, the correction that occurs after the uh, you know the end of that first big swing down and then we want to grab a chunk of this next move okay and that occurs on these various time frames so the way that I have it broken up is into four operative time frames and what that means is we're identifying corrective waves on an hourly chart on a 15 minute chart and then a little bit faster on a five minute chart and then some of these much smaller intraday uh, day trading type corrections on a two minute chart and for each of those operative time frames there are very precise characteristics to the wave structure that has to unfold in order for that to be considered the operative time frame for that trade setup if that makes sense so if I could describe it here on the hourly chart real quick and you guys see the hourly chart now right good so if I could describe it like this here on this hourly chart we've got a resumption of the the big trend down which we just saw on the 240 minute chart this trend here and it's funny how this high occurred uh, I guess I shouldn't go into the details of that because it is a little advanced but the high here is 218, right? 2818. Right? This is a non back adjusted contract that leaves the gaps between the rollover. I just said I wouldn't go into it, and here I am going into it. My mind has a mind of its own. So the high here on the back adjusted contract was what price what was the price there anybody know 
2818. So here it barely missed it, and then it looks the same way on the back adjusted where it didn't quite you know, make a new high. But when you're looking at the truly traded price of that high, which was 2818, we came right up and tagged 2818 to the tick, gapped up into it Sunday night, made a massive, massive buying climax, uh, climax in the relative volume, gave a nice little divergence, and then turned straight down. So once we see this down, we're looking for identifying any of these little retracements in here to get into a you know resumption of the trend, a continuation of the of the move. And exiting half at the most reasonable target that's uh, coming in typically before breaking the low and then trying to hold at least half for a break of that most recent major low. So these types of moves here are exactly what we're looking for. So this is a typical A, B, C in a downtrend. The main difference in this one, and this is an hourly chart by the way, is that the C wave, although it did take out the high, excuse me, and let me just mark this up real quick. So if that's an A, here, let me, let me see if I can just make it a little brighter here. The tools we have are just so incredible. So if that's a little ABC. Typically, you'll make it, depending upon the pattern that it is, and this would have to be a double three, uh, possibly a zigzag, but likely a double three. I'm not, I'm not going to try to explain all that, but we have quite a bit of uh, material on that. And there's, we link to a lot, of, a lot of different places you can study uh, corrective patterns in as much depth as you care to do. But I think it's the most important piece to this puzzle is understanding these patterns and then how uh, we find the exact ends of those patterns where the exact most likely spot for a reversal will occur and that's that's how we we do this map it out and the areas that we're trading from have been identified if not days in advance then hours in advance and we're waiting for those to be hit and we're waiting for uh, certain patterns within the volume and the momentum to confirm that the reversal is nigh and probable, highly probable. So what, what's different about this one is the fact that we had a very strong retracement back up and a kind of shallow and sideways move back down. Typically these corrective waves will trace out channels. Okay. When they don't, make it all the way to the channel, especially when it's a very steep A wave and a smaller, uh, weaker sideways type of a B wave, is when we make it to the midline instead. Okay, and there has to be divergence between these two, momentum divergence, which obvious, obviously there is, and you'll see that on the 15 minute and the five minute so what we're doing at this point, once we've identified that we are approaching the end of a corrective wave, we're looking for where the end of that corrective wave is going to occur, and we want to confirm it. So just to kind of walk you through that, uh, and by the way, we can. this is just one new skin of this toolbar that I've built out for you guys. I like typically, I like this horizontal one. And it's, we have hotkeys on all this. We have the most advanced alert system you could possibly imagine, which can function like an alarm clock, wake you up out of bed. Uh, I haven't made it to where it can send an arm out of the 
screen yet and slap you across the face when you make a mistake, but we're working on that too. We'll have a prototype in 2019. Um, hotkeys for all of these buttons, it would take me three hours to go through what all this thing can do. But what we're looking for is where demand is going to come in, where supply is going to come in. Obviously, in this case, we're in a downtrend. I want to know where the end of that corrective wave is going to occur so that I can short it and get a chunk of this. Isn't that what I want to do? So what do I talk, what do I talk about in the trading room every single day? Low before the high, high before the low. That's going to help you find the next area for supply. Hmm, what do you know? Look at that. Isn't that something? So I've got all these little hotkeys. I just updated my, this is pretty cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this uh, layout to you guys as well. I, I got a, um, it's like a gaming mouse, or what do you call it, a, a gaming keyboard, and um, let me just grab this. I'm going to show you guys exactly how I set all of my stuff up to make it as efficient as possible, but this is what I have, and I kind of reorganized it as efficiently as possible so that I've got, you know, my left hand resting on my armrest, and I've got a little tray that sticks out from the keyboard with this sitting on it. I can draw a line with this hotkey, trend channel with this one, median lines with this one, combine median lines, trend channels, warning lines with this, fib retracements, fib extensions, horizontal raise. This is a, a delete, uh, delete select button. This is volume profile, supply, demand. This zooms in uh, out of the chart. This zooms into the chart. This pushes right. This takes me to uh, the end of the chart. And then with my mouse, I've got all my hide buttons, delete buttons, export buttons, uh, change the monitor. So I'm quite literally as fast as anyone can possibly be at this stuff. And I've just redone my buttons here, and I'm not quite familiar. What in the world have I done? Oh, I'm sorry, I just changed the layout. Goodness gracious, Daniel. This is what preparedness looks like. Not really. So here we go. Now my hotkeys are working. All right. So low before the high to the low. In this case, see it finds the widest perpendicular swing here, which in a lot of cases that's exactly right. But typically when you're, well, not typically, um, all the time, when you're grabbing the low before the high or the high before the low and it finds this widest perpendicular swing, you want to drag it back. Then I got a hotkey to hide all these warning lines, but we need those, so I don't delete them just yet. And then I can bring them back over here. So now I want to uh, – where are you? Yeah, there we go. One second here. There it is. That's the one I need right there. All right, <laughs> sorry guys, let's do this again, shall we? So in real time, we're marking all this up and we're doing this in the, in the trading room and looking for where, you know, where this thing is going to end and um, just happens to be the one day that I 
am experimenting with what I've been building out in Blackbird. So I put on a sim trade instead rather than a, a live trade. But anyway, it comes right up into that spot. And we mark it all up, highlighting the areas and uh, export it. And then it shows up on everybody's charts. So this is on the hourly chart. And just by looking at the number of bars here, we've got 22 bars. So that's on the verge of being what I would say kind of in between an hourly operative time frame and a 15 minute hour, uh, sorry, 15 minute operative time frame. So what I do from there, I've got a particular set of rules that must come together for a trade to be allowed uh, to be taken from here. And what do we say all morning, every morning in the trading room from center median line to lower median line, from lower median line to center. And if we break it from lower to upper, so we define our targets based on the areas produced from the operative time frame that gave us the area for the supply, in this case, for the short, which we clearly respected and turned down from. So we're looking to make it down to that lower median line. That would be the, the main target. And then the first target in the way would be what? On the 15 minute. Let me hook up this little chart sync deal here. Let's see, do I make this the slave? I make this the slave. No. I haven't used this little chart. This is the coolest little thing that we've done. One of the coolest things for back testing and going bar by bar. You can sync up all the charts and uh, set which one is the, the master and which one is the slave. And uh, it's just really pretty exceptional stuff. So what I'm doing at this point is looking for um, what is, you know, if I'm getting into the short and I'll run through all of the um, things that must come together for that. But what I'm doing at this point, if I'm in the trade, I'm looking for where should I be taking the first one off and um, how far away is that area? How large does my stop need to be? And um, now that I have everything built out in Bloodhound and Blackbird, how, hang on a second, I'm linking this other chart up. which area am I going to, to use to trail my stop essentially? So what day is that? That's the seventh. Yeah, let me, I'm just gonna get it over here on this five minute too. There we are, right there. Okay. All right. So I've got a couple of major areas uh, that I can draw from. Let's blow this up. Ah, see, I'm not used to these new layout of hotkeys. So the button I used to have to delete everything now applies an alert. But anyway, I've got some major swings here. And with this divergence analyst, this thing is just so amazing. It, it took me, well, I'm not even going to tell you because it doesn't matter, but the amount of detail that went into creating this is so specific that it enables really the advanced type of pattern recognition that I've been wanting to do for 
well, since I began doing all of this. So we have three different swings built into this. So I'm able to highlight for you, if you have a hard time with the market geometry, you know, identifying the, the exact proper swings to draw from, this will do it for you now. And uh, well, we will too, as we export it and you can import it directly to your charts through that analysis live service. But this will not only do that, but all of the information that we have here at our disposal. And Jordy, I added in, not just for you, buddy, but <laughs> I know you wanted uh, all that stuff, w wanted to be able to see all of that. We added in data series to be able to count the number of bars that make up these swings and the distance and percentage of average range or total number of ticks, the speed of the swing, which is essentially well, it's the speed. It's kind of momentum. Well, no, it's not. It's, it's the speed. It's basically the ticks or the percentage of average range per bar, uh, which in this swing from this low to this high is 20% uh, of the average range per bar. So it's an upgrade. It's a, a up rise at 20% of the average range per bar. So a really fast move down or up would register something like we have here, like 0.5 or even 0.7 or something. So I wanna know the speed of the swing, programmatically I'm saying for the automation. Uh, and I wanna know the number of bars that make up that swing. So typically the threshold that I have for identifying what chart is the operative time frame for a given setup is basically between like 25 and 90 bars, something like that. It really depends on the, um, the type of pattern that it is, but I won't know that programmatically until uh, we port this to Ninja 8 and then I add in the, the other specs that I got. <clears throat> excuse me, written out for that. <sighs> Arm is hurting here. So anyway, I perform more clicks in the past five days than I think most people perform in a lifetime. And I think my hand is about to just fall off. But anyway, we have here 84 bars from this swing low to that swing high there. You see it? 84. And it moved up. 15.6 times the average range, average range of the bars, which is this value right here in the center, 27 ticks per bar on average. It's the average size of this 15 minute chart. And at a slope or a grade or a speed of 20% the average range per bar. Okay, so I wanna know all of that programmatically so that I know which chart is the operative time frame so that I know which rule set for the confirmation to give the signal. Okay, so once you know I have all that, everything's been met, it's all uh, confirmed or you know active, we, we have a one basically, zero for off, one for on, then we'll get the signal there. And once I'm in the trade, I'm looking for the next likely first target. And I have a couple of choices here, just on this one chart. I've got the low, sorry, I've got the high before the low. This would be the very first one. So I would, I would draw one from there anyway, but that is, too close in this case and we're cutting through that swing high. So this would be the one that I would use from right here as a starting point. And that would give me my first target to take half the position off there. John, yeah, all, everything that I do is all real time. I don't do any of that back testing or sorry, that back painting garbage. All of this is real time. Nothing that I do is uh, 
on bar close. Everything is always real time. The one thing that is on bar close because it has to be um, are these confirmations of the swings. So the, the way this develops in real time, I'm not going to be able to show it today, but um, if you have the minor swings active, see this is three different swing points. We have a minor, intermediate, and a major. And they build based on the relative distance from one to the next. It's, it's a pretty elaborate swing trend system. But it has to be to be able to do the type of pattern recognition that uh, I'm trying to do. So these numbers here visually won't display until a confirmation. But internally in the data series, we have all, all the access to all that information in real time. We don't display it for, say, a major in real time because, and I can show you this right now. Let me show you how it works. I can kind of show you how it works in real time. So this would be how it looks in real time. See right now it's a potential major. You see that little fuzzy outline to the little minor swing? So every bar, the way that it up, updates, is it, it's starting with a minor swing, okay? So you had minor swings here, this was a minor swing, minor swing. It won't become an intermediate until it moves down far enough uh, in the opposite direction. So it's not going to display that information above it just yet. I mean, we could make it do that. I guess maybe we should. Uh, but all of that information is available internally inside of our reader system here. So when I connect to that chart, this is the 15 minute. See, I can connect to any chart that has uh, divergence analyst on it on any workspace. But this is the 15 minute. So major potential swing types. That will tell me whether it's a higher high, lower low, double top, double bottom, lower high, lower low. Major potential bars. That will tell me the number of bars, which at that point is 84. Right there, let me just show you on the bottom of the chart. Yep. So this is what the strategy is getting access to. See, 84. So that's the first bar uh, where we have a potential major swing high, meaning that we've met all of the conditions to satisfy the major swing. Pretty elaborate stuff. And then this is the rest of the uh, conditions, requirements, and filters for the actual divergent setups and, and triggers. So everything is real time, and it's as, as efficient as it can possibly be. And that's, that was one of the main issues that we ran into before, which is why it's taken an extra couple of weeks to get all this stuff done. So that's one of many, many data series here. This is just right now, see, I have only the swings available on this 15-minute chart because I'm only using the divergence on the faster charts. And I'll get uh, to that here in a moment. Goodness gracious, 345, unbelievable. I need at least five more hours. So I've got potential bars, potential minutes, potential average range, any piece of information you could possibly want to get, I've got it in there. And this is to enable all of the pattern recognition, again, as I was saying. But visually, once it confirms, it'll first confirm as an intermediate because it can still go up, right? and then it would lock in as an intermediate once the high is broken. There it locks in as a confirmed major. So you have potential and you have confirmed. Just like with, um, well, pretty much most systems, uh, algorithmic type systems, 
you have the setup and you have the trigger. The setup is the potential. The, confirm, the trigger is the confirmation. So that's the way I've designed this, which is the, the right way to do it. So yeah, maybe we'll, we'll have the option to actually show that information in real time, but Bloodhound gets it, the strategy gets it all in real time. Uh, we just don't draw it until it's confirmed so it doesn't um, you know, take up too many resources as drawing is really the, the biggest resource hog. And what else do we have? And this is what enables me to do the ABCs. I can actually find ABCs now programmatically. You know how uh, you've got all these fake, I don't want to say fake. I, I don't know why I'm so negative, but you've got a lot of people that try to make Elliott wave indicators. Now, I think there probably are a couple of decent ones, but very limited at what they can do. With this, I can actually tell very precisely whether it's an ABC or not and in real time without waiting for any confirmation. So how I'm doing that, number one, I'm getting the trend from these swings and we have the trend here, which is one uh, color, one trend, which is based on if we're in a downtrend, then we have to break above the most recent lower high and then we're in an uptrend. Then I have another trend based on uh, the confirmations. So if we have a lower high that gets confirmed, then it's immediately in a downtrend. So there are two versions of the trend and we have intermediate trend and major trend, all from the same indicator. And I can show, and I know I'm talking 90 miles an hour here, but I'm gonna have to. Uh, I can show all of the swing rays that are broken and I have access to all of these data series now. And I can tell you when that lower high was broken and on which bar and what the speed is of that bar. And um, just, it's crazy. Every piece of information that I need, I have access to now. And uh, let me see, I've got to load some more days on this chart to be able to show it. So I can tell now that we're in an ABC, we've just taken out a major high, and we're at all of those areas in the market geometry. And then I can start looking for the confirming volume that I need to actually initiate the trade. This is pretty incredible. And now I can access all of that information for trailing the stops, the targets. Yeah, it is, Jordy. Yep. I decided to go ahead and do this. So the goal is to move everything to Ninja, Ninja Trader 8, obviously, right? Well, we could have either moved the version of Div Pro, which was basically rewritten three different times. I had only just started working with a programmer the first time we wrote it. He didn't have any idea that I would literally be giving him new stuff to do on a daily basis. So it wasn't extensible and it needed to be rewritten for speed and efficiency and to be able to do all these things that I wanted to do. So it was either convert you know, a half, whatever, uh, or make it the right way, do it now, and then convert that to Ninja 8 as a, f a finished, finished product. And then we'd have the same thing on Ninja 7 as Ninja 8, and I can uh, be running Ninja 7 in the background doing some testing with this stuff while I'm trading from Ninja 8. So, yeah, now I'm able to access all of this information inside of Bloodhound. Auto sync to last bar link. Yeah, there we go. What? Yes. 
it's this is a, a continuous contract and this is a front month contract so they don't like to link together until you tell them specifically to do so and there we are come on baby And there's one of the confirmation things that I'm looking for. There's a volume divergence. There's a big churn bar. But what I've got here, and see I had to load a lot of days back there. So it might take a minute to recalculate uh, for historically. Normally I, in real time, I'll have 500 bars on that chart. And it uh, runs as if there's really nothing even on it almost as if it doesn't exist. And let me say this real quick. If any of you guys are familiar with Bloodhound, I have mastered this sucker. I thought I did five years ago, but I have really mastered this sucker now. So to use it to its full potential, because we have so many, like for instance, with the Divergences Pro, we have single divergence, double divergence, and triple divergence. Let me give you an example of a double divergence real quick. This is a triple divergence right there. You see that? We've got divergence number one, which is, eh, it's so-so. Yeah, it's lost some momentum, whatever, but now we've really lost momentum. That's double divergence. And now even less momentum, waning momentum, and that's triple. And this one happens to be triple and a new single divergence. So because we have three signals, which give a one, two, and a three, when you have data series like that, which give multiple different values for the same bar, that's where Bloodhound can be used to be so much more efficient and we can change the output. And honestly, guys, this is gonna blow right by 80% of you. But this is why it's taken me a while to complete this stuff because of uh, the level of what I've actually put together for you, which I shouldn't give out. I should keep this and just go away and yeah. But because I love you guys so much, I'm not even gonna lock it up and I'm just gonna give it to you. But rather than setting a one here, which is what we normally do. Uh, if I change, because I have different strengths of signal, I have a churn bar, which is, you know, very, you know, moderate demand coming in, coming in at a low on a narrow ranging bar, uh, moderate supply coming in at a high on a narrow ranging bar. And then I have extreme churn, which is exceptional demand coming in at a low or supply coming in at a high. Because I have that strength of signal in most of these data series from all these different charts, from the volume and the divergence, and then from the market geometry, I can set different values for each of those and then combine them such that, you see how it says three of seven? So that means that I must have at least three signals from seven different charts to give me an output. Okay, that's what that means. So for every bar that's lit up red, I have three different charts that have divergence there on those bars. And then if I say, well, give me four out of seven, you see? So I take, if I just connect one of these solvers just you know, by itself, I don't get any output. I can uh, use this little test here. And I, I realize I'm getting over some heads now, but this is what has, 
This is what I've put together here. So I can use this and multiply it. Oh, that's the entry chart. I don't have enough bars on that chart. Let me grab this one. That's the one I put Blood or Blackbird on. So I can use this. What I'm doing is I'm increasing the multiplier, which allows me to create different uh, requirements. Remember, do you remember before where I would have these massive uh, Bloodhound templates that had solvers all over the place? They would take forever to load and it's just a mess. It was like that because I was trying to combine, you know, I've got different rules for different, what? Different operative time frames. these OTFs here. That's, these are the trend definitions for the operative time frames over here on the left. And then I would have different volume and divergence confirming conditions for the different operative time frames. But you see, I was never able to do this before until now. So now everything that we've been doing discretionarily, trying to find, you know, is this a setup on the 15 minute chart? Is it on the hourly chart? Five minute chart? If it's on the five minute, well then I don't necessarily have to wait for divergence on two out of five charts or I don't need divergence at all on a two minute setup. And I wouldn't expect there to be divergence on a two minute setup. But on an hourly operative time frame or a 15 minute operative time frame, I had better have divergence on at least three of those charts here, these faster charts, you see. So now I can tell Bloodhound exactly what I'm looking for. And uh, it's just, it's incredible. It's incredible. So this, let me get back to this trend definition here. This is, this is what my presentations look like when I'm totally unprepared and just excited. And uh, sleep deprived, of course, as per usual. I got stuff kind of dragged around here or something. I got too many bars on that chart, it's what it is. Okay. Let me grab this around. So that's the two minute. We're looking at that one right there. So that is an operative time frame for the hourly chart. And this is operative time frame uh, for the 15 minute. But the 15 minute doesn't quite do it. I can make it do it and I'll do that programmatically inside of um, Ninja Trader 8. But what happened was we were already in technically a, um, well, see, this is a new example here. Let me go back to the previous one. This is the one I'm looking for right here. Yeah, I'm bouncing around. Okay, so right here, what we did is we broke, see the red high there? It's a lower high. So if we break above that and close above, if we close above that line, that swing ray there, uh, that puts us, you know, by definition into an uptrend. But that's not, there's a few different ways to define trend, obviously, but in that case, we've broken a major high, so it shifts to blue, and that changes the trend internally here. But the way that I have it set up, see, first of all, I'm counting the number of bars on that 15 minute chart, and right there, it's over 80. See, it's 84. And I, you know, I used to say between 20. 25 and 120 and I made it really specific with 80 and I'm 
kind of wishing I wouldn't have limited it so much to 80, but I mean, I can change it right here. I can just say, let's set it to 90. And then recalculate it, you see? So now it's showing there. But essentially, the way that I've done this, and I, I did that for a specific reason, because the swing can get a little too big once it gets past 80 bars. And in certain situations, it, it can be just a little bit too much. It, it kind of depends on the whether it's a flat or a zigzag. For flats, it's fine. For zigzags, it's not fine. Typically, if you're 80 bars deep into a zigzag in a major trend, that's probably not a zigzag. It's probably a, a new trend in the opposite direction. So I limited, limited it like that uh, for that reason, among others. But it is, what, 22 bars on that hourly chart, right? 22 bars here. Show bars. 21. So that meets the requirement. So this is an hourly setup, right? So that means that I've got an operative time frame of the four minute chart and I need three out of five volume divergence signals. And what do you know, I've got it. I was thinking about adding in these uh, two bar patterns, but that limits it so much. The ones that are left are no brainers, you know, better take them or you're going to feel like an idiot, but it limits it, you know, a bit too much. So I am requiring um, three out of seven divergences, which that's, ah, yeah, it's too far back. We'll get into some of these recent examples here in a second, man, it's already four o'clock. All right, John, this stuff takes me so long to go through when I'm unprepared like this, but there's just so much to it and it excites me so much that I've got it done. It's, uh, I could just talk all day on this, but you guys want to, you want to take a five minute break and go another half hour or 40 minutes or so? You want to just take like a five minute bio break real quick and keep on going because I'm going to go through some of the recent trades that we've had in the ES and then kind of wrap it up with um, some really, really amazing market geometry examples here. But just to wrap this one up, I'm requiring um, churn on four out of seven charts. We've got that volume divergence on three out of five. We've got that, uh, obviously, the trend from the operative time frame, which is the, which is the hourly. We've got that. And all I need to do is combine that with the market geometry, which I have inside of Blackbird, and it's on. I mean, there's, if anyone has ever done anything like this, I'd like to meet them. Essentially what this is, is automating what I've been doing discretionarily this whole time. It's not every single detail of it. You know, I mean, the market geometry has to be drawn manually anyway, but um, it's way beyond anything that I've been able to do thus far. Figuring this part of it out, how to use Bloodhound in the most efficient way possible and building the ratios for this. You wouldn't believe how much time and uh, just energy went into creating that. It was um, pretty insane. I'll just show you real quick what it's looking like now. And I know this is whatever and it's nobody's going to understand it but just to give you some kind of an idea as to uh, 
what I put myself through. It's kind of ridiculous, maybe. But this is how I've had to structure it to figure out which values to use for these different signals. So I got the volume spikes, I've got the high density churn, extreme density churn. I'll end up giving this to you guys once I get it in a format that everybody can under, under, look, understand. So that's with three signals, which is pretty big. But when you get into four signals, you know, to the fourth power, it gets ridiculous. I didn't even continue it on any further. That was as far as I needed there. But this is how I figured out um, which values to use and how to do it based on strength of signal so that I could get access to all the signals from all the different charts and um, put them together in these additive ways. Because volume is very particular in the way that we've got to do this with the multiple time frames. And I know a lot of you guys have had trouble with the multiple time frames. I think a lot of people think that it's not necessary, that it's overkill, that it doesn't add anything. It's, that's just not true. I mean, the way that volume and price action works if you're getting a price action signal on one chart, you're definitely not getting that signal on another. If you're getting a volume signal on one chart, you're definitely not getting that same signal on another. But when you use the right ratios between the charts, between these different uh, faster confirming time frames and it took me a while to get the the ratios right that would display the volume um, information properly and i'll show you the difference between ninja 7 and ninja 8 ninja 8 is just incredible with the relative volume on the tick charts it's almost hard to believe that uh, i was able to get it to look the way that it does now it's uh, pretty sick. So like on a tick chart, this was the short that Josh took in the room uh, Friday. Unfortunately, I think he closed it here. But I mean, that, that was the safe exit right there because it could have turned up into a complex correction. But well, I still I think it was a thousand bucks in one contract. But anyway, if I show you that same chart in Ninja 7, I can't put volume on it. I mean, I could, I could do it. I could put the volume on it. That's this swing high right here. Oh, and what do you know? It's a perfect symmetrical move there in the supply and demand. Hmm, perfect. Absolutely perfect. Yep. So if I put volume on here, it would be gobbledygook. It wouldn't make any sense because it's a tick chart. But we made the relative volume for tick charts now. And just look at the volume signals we have now. It's, I hope I don't get knocked off. Kind of scares me. Two bar pattern here at this high, big churn bar at that low, massive extreme churn bar at that low, churn bar on volume divergence at that low. And what do you see at every major low, every major turning point? Extreme climax churn, two bar pattern. Climax extreme churn two by two bar pattern. Climax extreme churn two bar pattern. 
And then what do you have right there at the high? Climax churn, two bar pattern, where he shorted. It's crazy, isn't it? And then look at the toolbar for Ninja 8. Check this thing out. So I've got all these different charts, but I've got to add the toolbar indicator to them in Ninja 8 because we don't have a floating mechanism uh, like we do in Ninja 7. Just because of the architecture of Ninja 8, we probably will once they uh, give us access to all that. But I can just click here, auto add the links to the current workspace. Boom, it just added it to all the charts. Do you want to close it? Yeah. See? So we have the alert system now for the toolbar. I gotta turn this window deal off here. And it's we've got all the internals done, we've got all the major systems done. It's going to start flying now. We did all the stuff that we thought was going to be uh, just about impossible to figure out, but we he figured it out. I shouldn't say we, he figured it out. And um, yep, you can add alerts to that. We don't have the screenshot in there yet, but you've got the whole email system, alarm clock, pop-up messages, uh, change the workspace, you know, if it pops up and the alerts on a different workspace, hit the button and it flips. So we got all that. We got the fibs editor now, so you can edit the fib values, set it up however you want it. That was a massive ordeal in Ninja 8. It's like 20 times longer than it took in Ninja 7. And um, what else? A lot of internal stuff. Risk to reward meter. We got the text now with the text editor. We've got the recolor tool, which I don't have any colors on here, but yeah. Pretty cool, huh? So we'll essentially what we're going to do is we're going to release the whole analysis live once we have the import manager for Ninja 8 and Divergences Pro on Ninja 8. And I'm hoping that we'll have betas for the second week, January 14th. So anybody that owns the toolbar before the end of the year will get the two free weeks uh, with a service where we're exporting all of our analysis directly to your charts through a server, through this form, Every time we export, that export will import to your import manager, and you can make it auto import, you can merge it with your existing, or you can mirror mine, or you could accumulate if you want, if you want to like play market replay and go through and uh, add them one by one as they came in through the day to see how it unfolded or whatever. Um, if you delete some and you don't want them re-imported, we've got the most elaborate system for this thing. It's just unbelievable. You can control the columns and you know make it as small or as large as you want. Really pretty incredible stuff. So we hope to have that by the second week of um, January, and then we'll we'll start this uh, analysis live service deal. So I'm gonna take a break for five minutes. Let's say six minutes, give you, give you guys time to take a break, get some water, and um, we'll come back through some of these recent setups in the ES, and I'll answer some questions, okay? Volume profile for Ninja 8, that will take about a week and a half, he said. So that'll probably come the first week of February. I'm hoping that we'll be done with the toolbar for Ninja 8. I mean, it still looks like, you know, this. 
but that's just visual. That stuff will be pretty easy to do. So he said all the major components are in there now. It's just a matter of uh, stacking the stuff piece by piece. Yeah, we're going to try to make that happen, Pep. He says he should be able to do it. Yeah, that's, that's another thing, Shakuri. We're going to add the whole... Yeah, I've worked with Delta extensively. I've built, I don't know, 50 or 60 different systems with it for 16 or 17 different people. And it definitely has some, some merit, but we're going to build that into the volume analyst for Ninja Trader uh, 8. So that is going to be the 4.0 version. This is 3.24. And the 4.0 version will have that volume delta built in. But yeah, just some of these signals in the um, relative volume on the tick charts and the row bars is just exceptional, like this high in uh, the ES the other day. We didn't have these signals in Ninja 7. I mean, I, I had a couple of churn bars in the two minute in the row too, but not like, not like this. This relative volume on, on tick based charts is just, uh, Well, it's self-evident. I don't have to keep harping on it. Anyway, I'll be back in five minutes. Okay, I'm back. Before I forget, I got so much goodies for you guys. It's crazy. Sorry I've been out of touch, but it's either answer a million calls and a million emails or get the stuff done by Christmas. And I elected to get the stuff done by Christmas. So sorry if I haven't responded to all of you. Check out the guide we have for the volume analyst. Pretty cool. We got it all detailed all the way through all the properties all the calculation modes density volume relative volume relative density volume per second all the properties explained all of the data series for accessing all the signals via the readers and um, all the definitions for the multiple time frame stuff the volume divergence set up some triggers. We have a pretty awesome alert system now. Look at look at the properties. Look at how we've <clears throat> completely organized everything. You wouldn't believe the amount of time I put into structuring this thing properly. Did the same thing in Ninja 7. These are all the text alerts. These are the different calculation mode properties from here. This is the multiple time frame stuff for the relative calculations, the block out dates for holidays, just all kinds of stuff here. We opened up the ability to change the moving average type uh, to trim the outliers so they don't skew the standard deviations, which is exceptional, really cool. And then the alerts, look at how nice and neat. We've got screenshots, chart flash. It'll pop up with a message asking you if you want to change the workspace so it can take the screenshot or it can do it automatically. And then each one with its own sound and email. We have our own server for the emails. It can email a screenshot. All nice and neat. Same thing for all the different calculation modes. Volume per second. Pretty well organized. Nice and neat. And guess what else I have? You know how the Bloodhound templates are unique to each workspace. 
Well, I have a tool now which will make available, I don't know, the end of the first or second week of January where I can bring in a template, say one of these volume and uh, momentum confirmation templates, which is <laughs> pretty time consuming to, uh, to change out. Let's get a different one for a different market. So you can have one master See, I'll grab the CL. See how it's connected to all these CL charts from all those different works from that uh, crude oil workspace. So these, the, this is the entry chart, the fast one that Blackbird is on, the trade management tool. And I go over here and find the entry chart, which is the fastest one is I've got a list of all of these. There it is right there. I select all those and boom, done. One, row one. Where's row one? Row one is right there. Boom, done. And one. Where is min one? Is it two minute? Right there. Boom, done. Then save it. How cool is that? So that is a massive time saver for me right there. And for anybody that wants to actually uh, do this themselves, probably f very few of you, but at least we have it now. Don't think there's another company that's even remotely close to doing what we're doing here. It's a good thing I don't sleep for you guys, I guess. So these are, well, let's come over here. Let's see. We got that for Ninja 8 too. So this is where we're <clears throat> posting to, every time I do an export, it takes a screenshot immediately and it posts it here in the trade room in our Slack channel here so that we can keep track of stuff and um, document what we're, you know, what we're doing. And this is what the 19th. So this is what I was exporting for um, the FOMC announcement. Typically what they do with those reports is they'll pop it right into an area or if it's already at an area, they just shoot it right out of it. And uh, this was that area. And of course I was building all this stuff out. I think Josh was running, running the room. He didn't have 30 seconds to make the decision and take the trade from there. And it would have been quite scary if you did, but then of course it went straight down several hundred ticks and uh, yeah, the bloodhound and blackbird stuff that I have built out, got it right. Three ticks from the high. So this is just before it's about to happen. This is the area that it's going to pop right into. There is uh, the pop into it. Rejection out of it. And then on this chart, it was, it was directly to that trend line. This one, it went up and hit the center median line over through the top of that channel a little bit. Looks like Bo had it there perfectly. And then this is the move down and out of it with the target down here. I had a really nice correction back up, which came, it was a five minute trade. 
It's like a 61.8 retracement there, 50 or 61.8, perfectly right from that low to that low before the high to the low, came right to it perfectly. And then the aftermath right down to the target. There was the first target. Change the contract and have it ripple through. Hmm. Well, you can change the contract now and it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't disconnect it. But no, not, not with this. I mean, maybe we could make something you mean just to show that it's actually blue when you use the drop down menu? It's still connected. It, it's just not showing the, the contract. You can roll over without it hurting anything. And then this was the, the other major area. That's one of my favorite looks right there. Which is perfect. <clears throat> of course, I was watching it happen as I was building these templates out. Couldn't do anything about it. I almost did it just manually, but I was talking to um, a programmer about something was wrong with the readers and we were going over it. <clears throat> I was sitting there, you know, keeping an eye on it, waiting for it, and then we. We, we had to meet before you uh, went to bed. And then there was the final target that I had right there. Of course, it came lower, but that was, what, a few hundred ticks, I think. And then here's me lining up the fifth wave down. That was a short right there, which lined up perfectly. That little triangle high. So this is how we do it. We just, uh, you know, mark it up, find the areas where support and demand, supply and demand are going to come in. And try to map it out as best we can. And when it all lines up perfectly, it's pretty spectacular. And this is where Josh is lining up. Uh, for the short on Friday, right up here. He was running the room. Yeah, so yeah, looking for the low and then the retracement back up, which he's got mapped out here. I was thinking it could be a major low, but you know, when you're in a downtrend this fierce, you just take every pullback until uh, one fails basically. You're not, you're not trying to pick bottoms here. And there's the low for the fifth wave, and there's the A, B, and then we're looking for a whatever, a double three, I think it went sideways to down and then popped up one more time for Friday, which he already had mapped out, which was right there. And then it went up and I think he nailed it pretty well perfectly there. Yeah, there it is. Boom. NASDAQ was even prettier than that. NASDAQ was totally perfect. And this is him in the short, and he exited right there, I think. And then it, you know, of course, came on down and broke the low. That's the thing with trading multiple contracts, though, if you can at least take one off at the first safe exit and then hold for uh, the break of the low or the high that you're expecting, then, yeah, see, this is the screenshot I took when we first started. See how it just pops up right here in the channel? 
So right when it shows up on your charts, the screenshot will, will post here. Yeah, see. Pretty cool stuff. All right, now what? That was this high that I was just showing you on Friday. And look at it. Something else, isn't it? That's a good question. What is the ES bottom target? I thought this was going to be a, an important low. And then, of course, we get this sideways to nasty, which is obviously corrective. If it was the low, this from here would have gone right up. And it didn't do that. And that's the first major area of resistance right there, very clearly. Uh, let's go over that real quick. What else did I say I was going to do? I can't even remember. what I was planning on doing. This is a logarithmic chart of NASDAQ. See, logarithmic, which means it's based in percentage scale rather than arithmetic scale. And that's the major channel in the NASDAQ, which, whoops, which we have not broken. So we haven't broken that one. We have broken some major areas in, uh, the ES and the Dow, uh, but on the logarithmic scale, we still haven't quite done that. But look at the size of that down bar on the week. The last time we had something like this, after already being in a down move, see we had a similar bar back here in the ES, but once you're already in a down move and then you get a bar like that what does that look like does it look like uh, does it look like that I sure hope not because if it does it's a disaster for the US economy that's a logarithmic here. Let's go over here. So we're at that median line right now. Honestly, that's the closest target I have right there. That's a pretty long ways away, isn't it? Right now, it's looking like it's going to come back into this area. If it's the high that uh, all the Elliott Wave guys think that it is, I mean, I, I was thinking that we were, we were doing the same thing in, in crude oil as it was happening, I mean, this counted as a perfect five waves up after an already extended third wave up. This was just a, you know, another perfect five up on none other than volume divergence ending on a two bar pattern there for the fifth wave. So, I mean, it was a pretty clear fifth wave for a correction back down I was just thinking that, you know, it would break this low and then we would find support right in here and we've just blown through right through all of that. So it doesn't look good, but let's look at it for a minute. You do have this area right now that we're on 
So that's what I was saying when we were first getting started. If, if it blows through this spot that we're at right now, next week, then it's, it's going to get pretty ugly. But I would really expect some demand to start coming in here Sunday night and um, Monday to some extent. A lot of times they use the holidays for major turning points, if you haven't noticed in the past. If you'll go back and look at a lot of these major lows and highs, a lot of them occur uh, on or near holidays within a day or two. And I think it's easier to manipulate with uh, less volume. And that is a real thing. Yeah, I see you're at the top side of this channel as well, right there. So we do have quite a bit lining up right there where it's at. You've got that center median line there as well midline of that upsloping channel you see it in the midline so we are at a confluence of areas at the moment but again that's the biggest down week that we've had in quite some time maybe not necessarily percentage wise i think this was more of a percentage move down than than this has been but uh as far as total total price distance and ticks, it's a massive down bar. Let's look at the ES. See the nice two bar pattern we had there? Climax followed by a churn on volume divergence. That's a rare, very rare thing. Uh, just massive momentum divergence as well. That was a pretty, pretty clear top. Where was it? It was from this high. Yeah. And we were saying at the time, all right, it's turning down from the upper median line. So what's the target? Well, the target is the center median line. And it went straight through it. That's not a good sign. I had to delete everything when I remade all these uh, toolbar skins for you guys. Yeah, we're we're coming down to that that trend line. I mean, it's upsloping lower median line, but that's. Yeah, we're, we're probably coming much, much further down. Man, this is looking bad. This is not trading advice. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm not recommending you do anything. But it doesn't look good for sure. Well, you did hit that warning line there. Yeah, we're probably going to get a bounce right in here or trace back up, psych people into thinking we're going into a bull market again and then uh, come on down and then crude has just been incredible. Crude was about the most perfect set up at that high <clears throat> that I've ever seen. It was just picture perfect there. I don't think well, I'll ever see anything quite like it again. Goodness gracious, I gotta get the hang of these hotkeys. I've changed up. Yeah, I mean, it was just unbelievable. We had a training session where I was going over this, and uh, you took it too, Mr. Deck? Yeah, it's a bunch of, bunch of guys. I was talking about how I wished I had 
uh, whoops, I just deleted the, one of the main lines there that I wish I had a big equities account. I'd get a bunch of options in USO because of the position that it was in. And it has gone straight down in a straight line from there. Quite literally picture perfect. Back into these lows. This is the non bag adjusted contract, which for the market geometry is essential to have. I mean, it doesn't get any prettier than that. I think it was probably a 61 8 retracement. Yeah, it was from this high. I mean, you had everything that you could hope to have there all coming together just on the weekly chart. And then we had another uh, six or seven different areas that came together. It counted perfect. It was the prettiest setup I think I've ever seen ever. And it happened to be on a weekly chart and then look at the move down. So crude is headed for below 30, believe it or not. I know that sounds crazy, but that, it sounded crazy when I said it uh, back there too. So anyway, this is the way the markets work. It, it's not anything else. It's volume and geometry. I don't know if it's geometry because of the nat natural growth cycles to the market or because uh, all those people have such a fascination with geometry. Maybe it's a combination of both. But that's definitely the way it works. And anyway, this is why I've put together all this stuff so I can capitalize on it and do as much automatically as I possibly can. And um, it takes a lot of money to make it. And I've got bills to pay and mouths to feed. And so you guys are welcome to enjoy it with me. Shall I take some questions? I better wrap this up so I can get all this stuff out today. What is the best PC for running Ninja 8 on? Mm, as long as you have at least 16 uh, gigs of RAM, a solid state hard drive, you don't need those M.2 drives. I don't see any added performance with it. I guess there is some, but they have these new M.2 drives that are pretty fast for writing, reading and, and writing the data. And uh, an i7, you know, anything faster than 2.4, you, you don't need to buy a CPU for a thousand bucks. Honestly, I would just get a Dell XPS with a couple of good graphics cards. You can go to, I don't know if it's Walmart or, no, I think it's directly at dell.com and you can kind of custom make one there. And I think I paid 1200 bucks for mine and it's been running for three years nonstop. Bruce says daily, uh, Dell Alienware R7 is a good deal. Yeah, I like those XPSs because they're, <clears throat> they're good, they're fast, and they're pretty solid and they're totally quiet. Are the shade channels deviations from the VWAP? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is just a free VWAP indicator here on this one. But we've also got, I haven't had time to go into all this, and I probably should have, but we have um, volume profile built into this as well, which is also readable by strategy from any chart, any time frame. So all of these areas are accessible from within Bloodhound and the strategy. We have profile per bar, uh, point of control per bar, Volume cluster per bar, everything. 
this isn't even hooked. Let me just turn that off. It's not even hooked up. And what else? The VWAP, point of control, low volume node, full control controls over all of this. Volume cluster, value area high. And then you can make it like a VWAP with the profile, without the profile, with the labels, without the label, labels. We have a probably the most advanced volume profile uh, range select volume profile. It's not really an indicator. This is not an indicator. It's using the charts as a canvas and it has its own data management system and it's just, it's crazy. Nobody can draw a profile that fast without loading tick data for the entire chart. So for instance, I'm not connected to data right now, but maybe I've got enough tick data to go back. Let's see. I'm just going to hide everything. So for instance, drawing a profile across contracts on an hourly chart using tick data from almost a month ago. I don't know if I'm connected to data. Yep. See how fast that was? Who can do that? If you know them, give me their number. I want to talk to them because they probably have mine. So this thing is as efficient as humanly possible, as alienly possible. And uh, I didn't get a chance to show you all the trade management stuff and Bloodhound and how we're managing the orders with trailing behind areas and exiting on volume divergence at an area and then all the different trailing rules I have and yeah, we'd be here all day. Look at that high. Boom. Perfect. That was the high that Josh took on Friday. And there's your target right there. First target would have been that lower median line for me. And then the second would be that trend line where it closed. But it was so many different areas. It was from back here as well. Look at that one. I mean, even, even that one was symmetrical. Look at that. Symmetrical number one. Median line from there. Where did I just draw that other one from? Goodness gracious, I'm losing my mind. I need some sleep. All right, let me take some questions. Yeah, so this does swing trading and day trading. So I've got uh, four operative time frames built out there. And I'll show you guys. We'll spend some time on that in January. We'll, I haven't done any training sessions because I've been trying to get all of this stuff done before I even attempt to try and explain it all. Um, so where is that one? Goodness gracious. I'm so turned around here. Here we go. So this, oh, I'm sorry. That's the market geometry. You got lines everywhere. It's showing all kinds of stuff all over the place. Cause I got, all these lines everywhere. Uh, yeah, here I have four different operative time frames built into this. So if you wanted just swing trading only from the larger charts, you would just disable these. You would disable this set, min two. And this set, then one, which you can do from here. I'll show you guys how to do all this stuff in January. So the market geometry service is going to be where I'm exporting all this directly to your charts. Again, we're going to do it from 7.30 to 10, 10.30 really. So we'll spend the first 30 minutes from seven to seven 30 
preparing more efficiently than we, I mean, in the past two months or so has been total chaos while I've tried to get all of this stuff done and finish before Christmas. And it's just been, I don't know. I hope I can recover from it, but I'm taking next week off for sure. So the trading room will absolutely be closed next week. And I'll send out an email about that when I send out the update. And um, we're going to start the two week trial for everyone that owns the toolbar. Anybody that owns the toolbar, I think January 14th. And then we'll run that for two weeks uh, for current owners of the toolbar. And then um, if, you know, we come across any issues, which I don't think there are any, we've made it about as robust and solid as we can possibly make it, then uh, we'll address those and then launch it first week or second week of February for everybody. But it does require that you own at least the toolbar to receive the objects, the market geometry and the um, market geometry bloodhound templates if you want to use those if you have bloodhound okay and then we're going to do first for probably two or three months at least two months just crude oil s p 500 nasdaq 100 futures and the euro currency futures the 6e and we'll have uh Elliott Wave marked out on there. You don't have to import it if you don't want to. You can control whatever you want to import. You don't have to import the fibs or whatever, you know, the text. Uh, we'll get to the point to where I'm writing, you know, as much information on the chart directly about what's happening before I export. So that'll come through as well, the text, uh, the volume profiles and then the charts and the markets. And you can filter based on um, whatever market here. And you can filter based on the most recent files, see what's imported, what's not. So I can import, for instance, Josh's here. Let me see if I have one for the ES. Let's see. Daily, hourly, weekly, five minute. Let's do a five minute over here. So here's my five minute chart. And this all happens automatically in real time. If you set it to auto import, auto process starting, if I set it to mirror, it will delete all of mine. But if I want to add his to mine, I set it to merge. And then if I'm behind, I haven't had it open in the morning and I want to add just the most recent one. So there is Bo and Josh. There's the five minute from Bo. And I can import that. You see? And there's his objects there. And then, let's see if I've got an hourly. It's going to be $100 per market per month. And I'm going to um, do a special deal for you guys that have been with us for a while. And anybody that's in the trading room will get one market with the trading room. And then you can get uh, a second market or if you want all four, I'm going to have some packages worked out. But if you just wanted a single market and you just have the toolbar, it would be $100 a month for that. 99 a month. Uh, let's see. So I'll import Josh's first. I changed my rollover or my uh, data. I'll explain that here in a second. Let's see if, yeah. So what I've done with, um, I've spent some time on this. I 
probably shouldn't go into detail on this right now, but data is the most important thing that we have, especially when it comes to market geometry. And come to find out, you know, the, the ratios that are used to eliminate the rollover gap to merge the contracts together when you have your data policy set to merge back adjusted. I may go over um, some heads here for a minute, but just to explain why this didn't import those, it's because I've changed my data policy. So what I've done is I'm using the um, continuous contracts now to not back adjust. And then I'm merging and back adjusting the back adjusting the front month contracts, but the contracts themselves have, uh, well, I'm not going to try and go in there and show you. They have ratios that eliminate the rollover gap. And for some reason, the ratios for this last contract, for some people they were missing, for other people they were nine, nine and a half, for some they were two, negative two, three. The proper ratio is four. I've written some stuff out about that and I'm going to uh, email you guys out about that. There's a way to correct it in here and reset the instruments. But um, if you haven't done that, it's, it can cause a problem here, but that might not be exactly what's going on with this. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. I just need to reload the chart is all I'm not connected to data. So, that's that's not why, because I was explaining it and thinking, well, that should still import. It would just be maybe offset a little bit. So yeah, I just needed to reload the chart. See, you can remove, import. So if I don't like that, I can remove it. I can kind of check out, see what Josh is doing. What does he think? See what Bo is doing. What does he think? Little add a date there. And then um, let's see, what do I have here? Most recent for the hourly. I had one earlier than that, but there's one. See? So there's what I've got there mapped out for the low right there. And there's your high. We had literally about 10 different areas at this high. The same at the previous one and the same at the previous one. It's been just a beautiful downtrend that I haven't been able to take full advantage of because I've uh, been working night and day on this stuff. Anyway, we got some questions. So that's just a little bit. We're going to do a proper presentation with all this stuff. I just haven't had time to go through it all, but this is what we're going to do. Crude oil, ES, NASDAQ, and the euro. Market geometry, Elliott Wave and Fibonacci will be on it if you care to have it. If you don't, you don't have to import it. And we're going to do down from, I think, from the 240 minute down. Uh, probably we'll just end up including the daily and the weekly excuse me, but eventually we're going to have a higher time frame service where we combine everything from the higher time frames for say, I don't know, daily, weekly, monthly for like 20 different markets. And we'll have that as a separate product. So it's going to be geared towards kind of hybrid between day trading and swing trading for the first couple of months. But my goal is to move into swing trading, stocks, Forex, and futures. Because swing trading is truthfully where the money's at. It takes less time to monitor more markets. You get better setups. And you don't have to sit here like a bump on a log, click, 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 click all day long on your two minute chart. You can monitor more markets. We have, you know, the most advanced alert system ever produced anywhere and uh, actually enjoy your life a little bit while you're waiting for the next setup. 
And yeah, I'm going to do, I'm going to do Bitcoin too. Mm-hmm. I don't know about all the other ones, but, um, I'll have to look into it, but yeah, we'll, we'll do Bitcoin as well. So my goal is to have a basket of stocks, Forex futures, and not doing anything faster than a 15 minute chart. But that'll be, you know, I don't know, middle of, middle of next year. We're going to focus on these four, like I said, for the first couple of months. And um, regroup probably in April and try to figure out exactly how we're you know, going to do it moving forward. But the goal of this is to, you know, identify the prettiest, nicest, cleanest areas on as many markets as we can so that we can uh, have a good mix of instruments and take only those pristine setups. Because when you're day trading and you're watching two, three, I mean, even three and four markets can be too much. Sometimes two can be too much. Um, but when you're doing that, it, it gets the, to the point to where you can start manufacturing trades because you haven't taken a trade all day and you're like, eh, I wish something would set up and oh, this looks good enough and you pull the trigger and then you've lost money for the day when you should have just done nothing and sat on your hands and waited for the next setup. Why would I do stocks? Because of options. And you can take a smaller position size. You, you have to have a large enough account to be able to do it. But I would do stocks because they move. When they move, they move very, very fast, depending upon the stock. But a lot of the setups, I've been going through it for a while, are just picture perfect. You might have some risk with, you know, some reports and whatnot, but uh, with options, you can actually make more with less taxes or, you know, maybe an issue, but not everybody can hold two or three futures contracts overnight. But with stocks, you can take a small enough position to where you're in the game and you can hold a position for more than a couple of weeks and uh, not not be totally tied up, tying up your whole account. It's to be able to trade more, have a larger group of instruments to select uh, the best setups from, and to also just have a better idea as to the broader market conditions as well. Makes it to where you're, you're you know, you're you're watching more markets. You have a better feel for the underlying of the ES and um, yeah, just a, a lot of different reasons. The account size does need to be larger though. Well, what I'm saying is you have to start with at least 25,000, whereas with futures, you can start with five, but if you're starting with five, then yeah, if you don't really know exactly what you're doing, you'll lose that pretty quick. I mean, I did that just to prove that it could be done with that track record that I did, but that's kind of a rare thing to start with five and then, you know, double, triple, quadruple and all that. But um, yeah, with uh, at least 25,000 in your equities account, you can trade options and take some uh, better swing positions. So this is another spot that we're at right here as well as all those areas on the weekly. Uh, we're here at the bottom of this channel in the ES, closed right on it, on a big fat churn bar on the hourly. So we do have demand coming in there. And we're also right here. So we're at a pretty nice spot to put in a low, but if it breaks right through this, then look out, look out below. Uh, I don't know. I would have been tempted to pick up some stocks or 
Yeah, probably some stocks that were in a, a more of a bullish position at this low and see what happens on Monday. But if Monday closes through this area, then um, that's going to get nasty. Yeah, that's another one, Spot, spot Forex. Yeah, Jordy, uh, stocks would be purely, purely for swing trading, yeah. I wouldn't do uh, day trading, really, with that. Yeah, Vince, that's, that's kind of what this whole thing is with Bloodhound and Blackbird. It's not really like a screener, per se. I mean, I think we'll eventually build that ourselves. Um, and I think NinjaTrader 8 does allow that type of development now with the whole add-on system. The market analyzer isn't quite designed the way that it, it would need to be for us to be able to do that. But um, if we had our own type of market analyzer with this reader system where we could, you know, have everything that I've built out here in Ninja 7 on Ninja 8 on all those workspaces in the background or even all combined on the same workspace. And then I could have a little screen, um, like a, well, yeah, like a screener, I guess. Then yeah, we could, we could make that work, but the way the market analyzer is set up, it would have to be kind of, um, reverse order. Like the columns would have to be the rows. The rows would have to be the columns, which I think we can do pretty well, I don't know about pretty easily, but I know they give you access to be able to do all kinds of stuff now. Yeah, that's right, TJ. Yeah. To be able to manage your 401k and IRAs and all that. Yeah, I'm not sure about the automated market geometry. I haven't gotten that far yet, but I know that the the swing trend algorithm that's in Divergences Pro will, will make that feasible, make that possible. So I better get going so I can finish the stuff and send it out. This is the link. Like I said, this is the last time it's going to be five grand for all of this <clears throat> and we're going to move to a uh, some kind of a lease lease based system next year even if nobody buys it i don't really care as long as i make enough to pay my guys but we're changing the way we're doing stuff so this doesn't even come close to describing what all it is and I didn't do a, a very thorough job of it today, but that's, that's the best I could do today. I've, I've been so drowned in development and trying to get all this stuff done by the end of uh, the week and before Christmas that it's, I can't believe I'm even able to talk today, to be honest with you. I know I'm going to sleep good tonight, though. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, John. Yeah, so five grand would get you all of all the tools down here at the bottom. Let me just send you the direct link to that. And use the discount code. That gets you everything except for Bloodhound and Blackbird. So if you wanted the automation stuff, uh, all of that is built inside of Bloodhound and Blackbird, which are here on the home page at the bottom. I know a lot of you guys have it already. So there's the link to Bloodhound. There's the actual page. Yeah. 
and Blackbird. This is the uh, trade management tool. This is what makes all of the order management, all the automation. This is the most advanced thing that anyone has ever made for a strategy for order management and automation. This thing, uh, if you can imagine it, you can build it. And I have some pretty elaborate stuff built out for this, for the trailing stops and for exiting at targets on volume divergence. And if, you know, churn or a two bar pattern comes in on an area while I'm in a trade, take half of it off or tighten the stop behind the trail. I've got a number of different uh, trailing orders in there now, trailing stop orders and trailing target orders. So, um, what is it right now? 520, goodness gracious. I may not be able to get the Ninja 8 stuff done. I've got, I mean, I might be able to do it. I'll definitely get Ninja 7 up tonight. The installers are up. I've got the uh, templates mostly done. I got to uh, reconnect some stuff and kind of tweak it out for the Forex and the stocks. But uh, I'm going to copy those with that little copy tool that you saw there. And um, do the same thing for the Blackbird templates. And then I'll upload those. Uh, again, the software is up. You can download it. But the new workspaces that are, that are coming out are optimized quite a bit better. So, and then the black, the uh, Ninja 8 workspaces are just way better than they ever had been. I've really fine tuned the, um, the volume on Ninja 8. We don't have the divergence on here yet, but it will be in January. So the volume in Ninja 8 is just beyond anything that, yeah, it's pretty amazing. So in the free membership, I have uh, here for market geometry, I have this guide here on data. This thing is like reading an encyclopedia, but data is the most important thing that we have and you need to thoroughly understand it if you're going to be working with volume and market geometry as we are which i mean that's that's what the market is market geometry and volume so i would read this if i were you guys differences between the data feeds tick data understanding the data settings. I spent a lot of time on that because it's pretty important. I'll show you how to reset the database, repair the database. See, this is the differences between the data. When it really counts, when it really matters. Pretty easy to prove market geometry is exceptionally above and beyond anything that anyone could possibly use for supply and demand. But if you don't have your data sorted out, it's just going to look like lines on your chart. So, and then we have that Ninja manager there for free to uh, manage some of that for you automatically and start everything up and get everything running so that when you sit down at your computer, it's all up and running for you automatically, ready to go, ready to, ready to trade. And we'll have a new one coming out, um, I guess the second week of, maybe, maybe the end of the first week of January that addresses some of the errors for Ninja 8. So we'll have a new Ninja Manager coming out, which this thing is pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, I spent, several hundred hours on that and several thousand dollars and decided to make it free for some reason. I don't know. 
I guess I can't help myself. I'm not trying to make a killing selling all this stuff. I'm just trying to pay for it so I can finish it and have the best trading tools the world has ever seen. So that's what I'm about. Anyway, you guys have any other questions? We do have some questions. Jordy asked a question about this. Let me just show you this. So the free indicators, which are also on that page, for some of you guys that aren't yet members maybe. So we have all these free indicators for Ninja 7 and 8. It's a long list of free indicators. So I added this for the Divergences Pro, or what it's Divergence Analyst now because it's its own little analyst which does all the analytical work for me. We built out this universal oscillator and universal MACD, which each of them have any and every oscillator that you might want to use for divergence. And um, with those, with any of those calculation modes, meaning Indicator, balance momentum is an indicator, calculation mode. Uh, CCI calculation mode, it's a CCI indicator. You can smooth the input, smooth the output, and normalize the output. So it's pretty cool. Just makes it to where you don't have to have multiple different indicators. You can just use one, and you can normalize the output. I'm not going to go into all the details of that. Uh, right now, it would take me an hour you can actually make it with um, the indicator, but the double stochastics, I mean, it goes right up to a hundred and then right down to zero. It's not, I added all of the indicators that were useful for actually measuring the momentum of the price action. That double stochastics is more, like a pure overbought, oversold type deal. Let me just double check that. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. Yeah. Yeah, see how it is? That, that doesn't resemble or relate to the actual momentum of the move at all. It's more of just a pure overbought, oversold type of a deal. So it's acting like this move up was some sort of high momentum move up when it was only, well, I mean, it started moving up from back here. So it's not really, I mean, you know, you may find some signals that would coincide with a high or a low, but the whole idea behind this divergence indicator is to really find when price is slowing down relative to the previous move. It's for a you know, very specific pattern, but you can add that double stochastic right in there. I mean, you can load it right in there. All you gotta do is go and grab it. There you are. And then Set it to stochastics and boom. There it is. So I'd have to modify the settings to uh, make it be able to find some of those, but there's one. Got that low there. Got that low. You can fine tune it and play around with it. So again, this is for Blackbird. This is for Bloodhound. Thanks, Joe. Merry Christmas and Merry Christmas, you guys. We've <laughs> got all these emails we were had scheduled to send out, and Infusionsoft was completely locked up for the past two days. So I'll be getting a refund for this month, I assure you. And there's the link to the master suite. And for the toolbar, if you um, can't afford the whole thing, we are splitting it 
into three payments if you want, just so you can get in now before uh, the coming changes in 2019. But if you just wanted to get involved in this analysis live service, then you at least need the toolbar. And there it is, just use this code here, TTPBF18. And you put that right here, right where it says have a promo code. TTP BF18 and then apply. And there you go. Check, check, complete. Okay. And it's well beyond what's described here now, as is everything. That site gets outdated about every two months. Yes, it will, Thomas. Yep. Um, Thomas is asking if he already owns something. Can uh, we deduct that from the master suite? If you want to write in, uh, one of the guys will, will sort that out for you. We got a um, thing they can work through and send you a custom link. So if you just want to write in to support, they'll take care of you. All right, guys, I better, I better go so I can complete this stuff or, I'll, or else I'm going to pass out. Thanks, Ava. Merry Christmas to you too. I'm sure I missed some questions, guys. Oh man, I'm tired. All right, you guys, I gotta go. Wish it was more structured and you know organized, but it's kind of been my mo this year. This whole year has been about development and getting everything done and on Ninja Eight and uh, marketing is whatever. I just wish I could um, have everything prepared well enough in advance to actually spend some time on a proper presentation. But yeah, at least the software is done. We've got a really solid start on Ninja 8. And all the concepts are done. The specs are, are done. We've got all the major components. Now it's just rolling with it in January and wrapping it up for Ninja 8. And we'll be done, and then we can focus on trading and just the analysis live and the trading room, and I can finally get back to trading again, which is going to be great. <laughs> I will, Bruce. Thanks. Thanks, Pep. John, Jordy, Patrick, Jim, Bill, Raymond, Omar, jo George, Tom, Wayne. Daniel, Shakuri, Craig. All right, you guys. Yeah, if, if any of you have any um, questions about pricing or, or whatever, what all is included. I know I didn't get a, a solid run through of all that there is, but we've got a lot of reviews on Google and on Facebook. So literally all you have to do is search for Trade the Plan and you can read what other people think about us. We have a lot of reviews on Futures IO. We also have an interesting thread in there from my old support guy, which kind of came unglued on somebody <laughs> in there. But other than that, yeah, people people tend to say nice things about us. So hopefully that continues. I strive so that it will. I think you guys will be quite pleased with this uh, this update here. And this will be the final one for Ninja 7. It's all Ninja 8 from here on. All right. Merry Christmas, you guys, and a Happy New Year. Everybody take care. If you do need to call, just go ahead and call now. And uh, then I'm going to get back to these, uh, wrapping up these files.
thanks for sticking with us. I so appreciate you guys. Couldn't do it without you. I know it's been a, a struggle. It's been a rough year, but I didn't expect it would take this long, but at the same time, it's going to be worth the wait. So hopefully I can avoid all these unkempt, all these unkempt promises in the future. Once we finally get a, a handle on all this, uh, just crazy development stuff we run into. Thanks, Brett. I appreciate it, man. Thanks, Mark. All right, you guys. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. All right. Bye, everyone.